This program is made possible with support from the Connecticut Small Business Development Center. They say the 2008 recession was all about Wall Street, and the pandemic-induced recession of 2020 was all about Main Street. And while the recession forced some small businesses in Connecticut to close, for many, it was a time to adapt, pivot, and muster the creativity needed to survive. For Connecticut Public, I'm Ray Hartman, and this is Cutline. Stay at home was the mantra a little over a year ago. And while I quickly shifted to working at home and hunkering down with my family, I couldn't help but wonder about how restaurants and other businesses that relied on foot traffic for their livelihood would get by. There is no doubt that small businesses were hit hard by the pandemic. According to the U.S. Census Bureau's Small Business Pulse Survey, 34% of small business owners in Connecticut say the pandemic has had a, quote, large negative effect on their business. That's about 4% higher than the national average. And if you think small businesses aren't important to the vitality of Connecticut's economy, think again. According to 2019 figures from the U.S. Small Business Administration, there were almost 347,000 small businesses in Connecticut, which accounts for over 99% of all businesses in the state. Small business employees account for nearly 50% of all Connecticut workers, according to those 2019 numbers. Although there is no reliable data yet on how many small businesses in Connecticut have folded because of the pandemic, we know it's happening. Just look at the empty storefronts in your own hometown. Each one a reminder of how disruptive this pandemic has been to business as usual. But on this edition of Cutline, we'll hear from four businesses that have survived. And later we'll visit one business that decided to open during the pandemic. Each business tells a unique story of finding a way to hang on and hopefully emerge from this pandemic even stronger than before. Let's meet them. My name is Pamela Steele, and I'm the owner of Pamela Ruse Specialty Hand Knits and Yarn. I am a uh, full service yarn shop. Um, besides yarn and needles, I uh, give lessons and I help people with their projects as well as I do a lot of uh, community, give back to the community. So our the community knitters and crocheters are also active in some of the, my community projects as well. I partnered with uh, Knitted Knockers. We make knit and crochet prosthesis for women who have had mastectomies because some women cannot wear the prosthesis. Um, they are provided free of charge to any woman who needs or wants one. I also do a lot with veterans. We make hats, mittens, and scarves because I belong to an auxiliary. So the community makes hats, mittens, and scarves, as well as we make hats and things for uh, homeless. I've been in business 10 years. I actually 18, I started a home base, but I've had a bricks and mortar for 10 years. My name is Rachel DeCavage, and I'm the owner of Cinder and Salt. We're an eco-friendly clothing brand based out of Southington and Middletown, Connecticut. Our name is inspired by the residue of a weekend well spent, the scent of campfire on your clothes and the taste of salt water on your skin. We primarily make screen printed apparel for men, women, and kids, and all of our designs are my original drawings. Um, and they're all inspired by nature, so animals, plants, life outside, and a sustainable lifestyle. We also sell wholesale. We're carried in about 400 stores nationwide right now. And we also do um, custom screen printing for other businesses. So our print shop is located in Southington. We have a very industrial setting here. And our retail space is in Middletown where we have a storefront on Main Street. I'm Rod Cornish and I'm the owner of Hot Rod Cafe. It's in New London, Connecticut. We've been here for about 15 years in December. Um, we've become known for our chicken wings. We've won a lot of awards. And um, it's sort of like the, I know everyone says this, but it's sort of like a family and it's sort of like our local cheers here. Um, people come here for all kinds of events happy events, sad events, and um, we're kind of a staple to the community, to the whole region, really. We had originally started out down the road a bit, also on Bank Street, and then we had an opportunity about three years in to, to get this current location, which um, 
we just did some renovations on and have a, a roof bar. So you can sit here and look at the water. It's pretty cool. It's, people joke around about what kind of place it is. It's sort of a very eclectic place. You can't really say, is that just one type of customer we have across all kinds of races and um, professions, just everything. It's some place where people can come, come as they are and just um, have a good time. It's a real laid back place where you can bring a family. Up. Our tagline is wings, beer, and atmosphere. And one of the things I like the best is um, oftentimes women come here and say it's the only place they feel comfortable going to by themselves because they know we're always looking out and it's just a, we don't really put up with any nonsense, but we have a good time. I'm Rich Martin and I'm the owner of The Telegraph here in New London, Connecticut. The Telegraph opened about 10 years ago. We're a, a largely vinyl shop. Uh, we're an old school record store. We do carry CDs and cassettes. Uh, we also sell turntables. Um, I'm also a recovering English major, so I have a wall of uh, literature and poetry and plays. So yeah, we're, we're providing the media for the masses, I guess. You know, it, it's it's pretty satisfying. It's it's a, across the range. I mean, we really we have young kids up to uh, uh, old geezers like me, I guess, and, and beyond, uh, <laughs> um, who are getting back into it. But I, uh, I was just talking to somebody about this this morning about how. You know, it really is every every age group is getting into this uh, resurgence and and finding their niche in it. So uh, any anybody can can join the game. So it's it's a fun 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 audience to work for. <laughs> Joining me by Skype is a panel of folks who will help us better understand what small businesses are up against and what needs to be done to get Main Street back on solid footing. Joining me is Fran Pastore. She is the CEO of the Stanford-based Women's Business Development Council. Felix Reyes is the Director of Economic Development and Planning for the City of New London. And Joe Ercolano is the State Director of the Connecticut Small Business Development Center. Welcome, everyone. So we chose four unique businesses for this show, all with a significant presence in their downtown areas. Panel, let's first talk about the challenges for small brick and mortar businesses in a downtown area during this pandemic. Uh, one of the things that we are seeing in our downtowns, obviously downtowns is a lot more dense. Um, it's not spread apart. Um, and uh, through COVID, um, the narrative is, you know, stay away six feet um, apart. Uh, so that uh, consumer confidence uh, and rebuilding that has been one of the biggest challenges uh, that we've seen with our downtown bricks and mortar stores. Absolutely, Felix, well said. Um, and, you know, we're because we have an office downtown Stanford, we saw foot traffic all but, you know, shrivel up. Then we started seeing a lot of creativity, right? A lot of a pickup. Most of the businesses um, in the downtown area our restaurants, they were hit the hardest. So we have witnessed a lot of creativity and a lot of innovation in trying to get folks, um, get some foot traffic back downtown. So I was really happy to see a lot of communities over St. Patrick's Day, especially the restaurant industry, really um, take that to another level. Joe Ercolano, I wanna get you involved and let's kind of go with what Fran was talking about. Let's talk about the ways these small mom and pops are vital to the vibrancy of a downtown area. Absolutely, there's employment. They employ people. They uh, put money into the economy by buying from other suppliers, local local businesses mostly. Um, the market is always both on the supply side and the demand side, a local market. So the money is staying in the community. I think what I've seen a statistic where 67 cents on the dollar will stay in the community when it's spent in the local business. Felix Reyes, uh, talk, talk a little, to me a little bit about the, the relationship that your local businesses have with the community at large. Absolutely, so you know, the, the livelihood of our neighborhoods are, are this, the center of that is our local businesses, like we had mentioned um, about employment, um, the, the supply chain that's uh, connected to it. And the, the interaction, and, and Fran hit on it, um, the, the collaboration that we're seeing between um, businesses um, is, is really special to see. A lot of the dollars are now being kept locally. I think businesses are being more sensitive to understanding what other businesses are doing, what they can provide, and collaborating with them and using them as a supply chain, as in the past they may have not done so. Uh, so we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of that, and that really builds a rich and strong um, neighborhood uh, and resiliency within our communities. Well, let's move on to our next segment. 
On March 23, 2020, Governor Lamont, by executive order, directed all non-essential businesses to close at 8 p.m. It was part of a stay safe, stay at home order. Now for everyone, business owner or not, it was a pretty scary time. Rich Martin, owner of the Telegraph in New London, says the writing was on the wall way before the 23rd. I, you know, it hadn't been normal for a while. I mean, it, there was a buildup. It wasn't just that date that really changed things. So, I, you know, I, I felt it coming. I also promote a lot of shows. Uh, I put on musical events and uh, I had seen dipping attendances there as well as in my shop. Uh, so it, I knew it was coming. I, I was very nervous. Uh, you know, we'd been, it, it had been a slow growth over the 10 years that the business has been going. Um, I, I, you know, I feel like we're still growing and still finding our sea legs and we're still paying down initial investments and debt and all of that. And, you know, I've been working other jobs besides this to help sustain the business um, and that support was going away. So, yeah, there was a lot of variables that were were frightening, I guess, at best. But I, I also saw it as an opportunity to sort of, you know, plow through it. And I, I you know, having come through difficult times before with, you know, recessions or whatever, if you can make it through, you come out stronger the other side. So uh, I, was, I was hopeful about the opportunity that came with the fear, I guess, of uh, the shutdown itself. You know, when we first, when we first shut down, uh, I, I immediately shifted to a messaging of, you know, being, being available if you need anything, I'm willing to drive it to you. If you want to just drive up out front or we can ship it to you. I also hadn't had a lot of online presence prior to that, and uh, I, I immediately set to work trying to solve that problem. And so I took a couple weeks to get, get a, a website going so people could order new releases so that they wouldn't be missing out on the new releases that were coming out during the shutdown. So, um, so there was a lot of reconfiguring. I also just, you know, I put up some fabric and closed off all the windows so it was clear we were shut down. And I did a lot of projects in the shop that I'd had been putting off forever because there just wasn't time and space to move records around and, and uh, build some shelving or fix some shelving and do that kind of stuff. So uh, yeah, it was, um, it was an interesting time, but it, I think it, you know, I was able to do some stuff that made the business better for the work I was able to do. My reaction, well, um, it was not surprising, but um, also I was a little disheartened because during that time is kind of still in the middle of my busy season. So naturally there was a little bit of a panic, like what do I do now? But um, most of us, like, you know, most business owners, we kind of adapt and um, figure something out. Were you afraid this would be the end of your business? Uh, actually, no, I was not afraid it would be the end of the business because actually with people um, now being shut in, I figured they would need something to do. And, and a lot of crafts uh, businesses picked up again because people needed um, an activity. And um, so I wasn't too concerned about it being the end. Knitters are gonna, and knit, uh, crocheters are gonna knit and crochet no matter what's going on. <laughs> it could be an apocalypse and somebody will find some yarn or string or something. So <laughs> it wasn't too concerned. Yeah, it, it, was, it was crazy. Like I said, right, it was right before we geared up for my absolute favorite holiday, which is St. Patrick's Day. And um, we usually have a huge party we, on all three levels. And um, so when it, when it happened, that's when we knew the writing was on the wall because they basically scaled back how many people you could have. And then all of a sudden they're like, all right, as of Monday, nobody's in the restaurant. My first concern was for my employees and my customers. My second concern was, wow, you just spent 300 something thousand dollars in the, in the state of Connecticut saying, um, nobody can come in your restaurant. So. I, I laugh now, but that's more of a nervous laugh. I, was, uh, I didn't know what was going to happen. So I, I tried to be a stabilizing factor for my employees and let them try to let them know it's going to be all right. Some of the employees on their own started doing like group chats and group emails, so helping figure out uh, what's the best way to get unemployment. Because I'm, I'm, you know, right away it was like unemployment you couldn't get through, but a couple of people managed to get through. So the, the team, the family really, really came together and it, it made me proud. So we were actually already closed. Um, on March 14th, I was planning to head up to Portland, Maine to do a trade show. And 10 minutes before I started to pack my car, the show got canceled. And over the course of the weekend, I was just keeping an eye on social media and many of the stores that we sell to, the people that I would be meeting that weekend were deciding to close their stores. So on Monday, I was like, hey team, we're shutting down. And so we 
closed a week before we were mandated to. I was never afraid that we would never open up again. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I do, I have always had this fear of a zombie apocalypse, <laughs> not necessarily the walking dead, but like a disease that was going to take us all down. So I was like, oh no, it's happening. Um, so I kind of had this like healthy fear, I guess it was an expectation that something terrible might happen. <laughs> I'm an entrepreneur, I was always gonna work for myself and I love what I do, so I'm not gonna stop even if there's a global pandemic and a zombie apocalypse. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so as we heard several different reactions to the order to close from the governor, let me ask you each in turn, what was your reaction? Well, I, I, I was um, happy because I, uh, we had closed our offices the week before and we're receiving lots and lots of phone calls from small business owners wondering what to do. You know, I think that there was a lot of confusion and a lot of um, effort to try to subdue some of that confusion. But in the end, I really believe that um, those closures did the right thing despite all of the um, closures that we saw with small businesses and a lot of the financial um, issues that came up as a result of that. Um, but I, I think in the end, the right decisions were made as best they could be with the resources and knowledge that we had at the time. I think Fran made a great point about, you know, we we were at the beginning of what essentially became, a, or it is a global pandemic. I mean, a lot of people were afraid, they were scared, people were getting sick. Um, I was on the other side of the coin of that. I had to deal with the small businesses and the mom and pa shops that were scared out of their mind. Their livelihoods um, were at stake. And um, and they called me as soon as, so what's the plan? Um, and for those first couple weeks, there was no plan. We've never dealt with anything uh, of this magnitude when you're having, you know, 20 something small businesses call you every hour and tell you, um, what can the city do? Is there any money? How do I pay my rent? Um, how do I get inventory? Uh, how do I pay my bills? And so, so then we had to, we had to triage that we had to figure out, you know, how do you help these small businesses and, and create enough programming and initiatives as the federal money started coming in to help, um, soften that. But we figured it out. I mean, that's the resiliency, um, and, and that 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 part um, came and, and shined uh, throughout. And that's what we're going to remember when all this is done. Uh, Joe Arcolano, what were some of your immediate concerns, and what were you advising small businesses to do in the short term? I would say, Ray, that you got. We should keep in mind that the SBA really moved quickly to put money on the street. So we were doing webinars with three or four hundred people around the emergency economic injury um, disaster loan by March 18th, March 16th. Um, hundreds of people were, were tuning in because it was the only available source of funding, emergency funding prior to the CARES Act in April. So to get this access, this money, we were amazed at how quickly people moved into that mode of tell us how to access emergency finance. And that's what we did. And then the other important thing too was I think closing things gave people a breather to understand the safety factor because they were scared about their own safety as well as their, as their clients and their, and their employees. So the safety factor was, a, was an important thing and, and closing the shops and, and restaurants, et cetera, was a chance for people to take stock of what do I do to assure safety? Yeah, good point. Felix Reyes, this order was the death knell for some businesses and many folded pretty quickly. Now I understand every circumstance is different, but what were some of the typical reasons some small businesses didn't survive? I mean, were they already in trouble before the pandemic hit? Well, it's, for every small business, it takes a while for, for, for businesses to, to generate enough revenue where there's even a profit, it takes years. Um, so some of the small businesses that were affected were probably kind of in their first six months to a year just operating. Um, and they, they just couldn't sustain um, all the, the, the expenses it, it takes to start a business. Um, you know, you, you put your life savings um, up and, and, and any equity you can find and all of a sudden there's no revenue um, coming in. That, 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 that was very difficult. So we did see a lot of um, businesses in kind of in that first or second year um, not be able to um, uh, remain open. But I, I do want to point out, if I may, that some industries were hit much harder than others. We know about the um, the restaurant industry. What we what doesn't often get talked about is the childcare industry. 
Within the first weeks of the pandemic, 70% of the childcare facilities in the state already shut down. And those were among some of the industries uh, that, did, that were already operating on extraordinarily thin margins, to Felix's earlier point, and did not have the infrastructure, like a lot of other small mom and pop businesses, to apply for any of the funding. I mean, you know, and I, Joe, I think you might agree, you know, we were not getting, the people that really, really, really needed it um, did not get it because, and they were the ones that shuttered, you know, already operating on thin margins, didn't have the mm -hmm. infrastructure in place to apply for a very complex, um, you know, federal program uh, that was put on the street with the best intentions, but not everybody could get through that that online application process. So that's what we really need to focus on right now, because those are the businesses that um, really the economy really needs them so that people can get back to work. The federal government came through with a series of measures to help businesses stay afloat. The biggest of these programs was the Paycheck Protection Program, or PPP. It allows certain businesses to apply for low interest private loans to retain employees in the short term and for other costs. The amount of the PPP loan is supposed to be equal to 2.5 times the applicant's average monthly payroll costs. Rachel DeCavage, owner of Cinder and Salt in Middletown, applied right away. Yes, I was the first person in line at my local bank branch. They were like, what even is this application you're handing us? <laughs> but I have learned as a small business owner and a young person with a young business that you just need to be first in line and pay attention and be super organized. So I was approved for the first round of PPP funding very quickly. Um, we used the entire amount on payroll. As soon as we received it, I got everybody off um, unemployment and back to work. Mm -hmm. why, was, why was the PPP the right choice for your business? It really allowed me a safety net to get everybody back to work because um, having to lay off your team is like pretty gut-wrenching. <laughs> it's like not a fun experience. So having, um, you know, just that safety net to be able to do that and get everybody back and not have to worry too much about going under if anything happens. I mean, COVID and this pandemic have been unprecedented um, and nobody knows what's going to happen. So it just, it, it makes sense to apply for it if it's available. I mean, I knew I wanted to, like I said, I, I really care about my employees. I knew um, I wanted to keep them employed. But when we were going, you know, our sales dropped like 90% a week, 80% a week. So, yeah. but I was still paying everybody. So, um, so that helped a lot. So we applied for the first PPP. I worked with uh, my local bank who had um, actually lent me the money to do, to buy the building and to do the renovations. So they were very helpful in getting the PPP loan. And, and then I was able to keep, people employed, um, the whole crew really. I didn't have to let people go right away. The, the entire crew was able to continue working, which, is, which was good, you know, for however many weeks that was. Yes, I did apply for the PPP loan. Uh, we received it in the first round. I, I didn't get a very big loan. I, I will say it helped me cover the, the first couple months of having my employee back. And so it, it was a benefit. Um, it did get me in the headspace of, of applying for other loans and grants that were out there. I missed out on the state loans. I, I heard about it, but by the time I, I went to apply, and I think this was days later, um, I, it, it was gone. It, it was not available to me. Um, so, and that, that sort of taught me a lesson to really keep my eye out and, and uh, make sure I'm hitting deadlines and all of that. So, um, you know, I, I also was very fortunate. I, I mentioned that I, I sort of applied for everything that I could find, uh, any of the grants that were out there. Um, and I did receive one rather significant grant from Do Adobe, uh, the software company. So you just never knew where, where funds might come from. And I, I feel like it was, it was worth sort of casting my lot wherever I could and wherever I had time to. No, I did not apply for a PPP loan. The first round that came out, um, because I'm a sole proprietor, really didn't apply to me and my husband and I discussed it and the rules kept changing um, and they were unsettling. So we just didn't want to take a chance and because it's just me, I didn't have to worry about employees, which was a good thing for me. And um, we just felt like it was, we would just set aside and, not, and just do what we had to do. 
So three out of our four businesses applied for and received a PPP loan. Joe Ercolano, how important was the PPP program to Connecticut businesses? Well, it was very important. If you think about last year in the first draw of the PPP program, $6 billion into the state economy through the PPP program. And in this year, we're running north of $2 billion already since January 11th. So incredibly important. It um, is a forgivable loan, as people know. So it gives the owners and the, the applicants a chance to not carry debt that they really can't afford given their, their uh, diminished revenues. Friend Pastore, what is your take on the PPP program? You know, I, I mean, for lack of a better, <laughs> better adjective, really priceless for so many, so many businesses. Uh, that said, it was priceless, priceless for the businesses that were able to access it. So 60,000 PP loans, I think, were the part was the first tranche in Connecticut. Um, roughly, I'm not going to get my percentages precise, but roughly 80% of those loans were given to white owned businesses and nearly 75% were given to white men. And so we, hence the correction or the dial back, if you will, with a couple of weeks ago where the focus was on the smallest of the small minority owned businesses, we still have a very, very long way to go in that regard. So, um, you know, getting businesses in the hands again of those most vulnerable, but getting money in the hands of the most vulnerable businesses is really something um, that we have to think about. So PPP wasn't the only resource, the state and some municipalities stepped in as well with grant and low interest loan programs. Felix, did that happen in New London? Absolutely. Um, one of the things that uh, we have the benefit is we have a community development block grant office. Um, and if, if, if folks don't know what that is, essentially HUD um, gives a, a pool of money to certain distressed municipalities um, to support, you know, the nonprofits, our social services, and our residents. Um, so we have an office, and we were we were granted, I believe, about eight hundred thousand uh, dollars uh, for a kind of in the CARES Act of COVID aid relief, and we were able to distribute that in several sectors. Um, we did small business grants, uh, we did uh, rental assistance, utility grants. Uh, we set up learning pods uh, because families now, kids, uh, family, moms and dads had to work. We, we live in a, in an urban city where most of the jobs are service industries. Um, they don't have the luxury of staying home with their children. And then also on the humanitarian side, we set up um, for food shel food and shelter, um, our homeless shelter, food banks. Uh, so we, we had to spread it out uh, thinly across the boards, but I believe the city did a good job on addressing that. But for our small businesses in particular, uh, we had grants between uh, 1,000 and 5,000 for those um, that applied. Um, the first round, we had about uh, 43 um, small businesses apply. And the second round that we just finished up, we had about, uh, about 50 um, businesses apply. And those, you know, even though they're small, 1,000, 5,000 here, for a, for a small business that's behind on their electrical um, utilities um, bill, uh, trying to find money to pay their rent. It's just, you know, it just gives them a little bit of hope that they can just keep going. Felix, I want to stay with you because we heard stories of municipalities getting involved in different ways to help their local businesses. Maybe it's a, a zoning situation or allowing uh, restaurants to open up uh, in a larger area outside of their restaurants for more social distancing type of eating. Tell me about some of the ways that, that New London stepped in to help. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, so I have an amazing staff, right? And we thought that we had a good um, process to get people through kind of a zoning application. But with the um, with the um, uh, regulations that came down from the state, uh, we were able to even expedite it even more. Um, so we're talking sidewalk permits, um, encroachment permits. So if no one knows an encroachment permit, essentially, you know, the, uh, right away, how do you shut down a street so you can put some tables out on a on a on an avenue or uh, an alleyway? How do you use the parking space um, in front of the sidewalk to kind of expand? Um, out. So we created, um, we worked together with all the department heads and we created a quick, easy process 
um, for two things. Whether you uh, wanted to expand your restaurant on private property, um, like say you wanted to put your restaurant in your parking lot, um, we created a, a, um, an administrative process to approve that quickly. Hey, Joe Ercolano, uh, what was your experience working with municipalities? Were they quick to respond and help out the small businesses? Oh, absolutely. Um, city of New Haven, the city of Hartford, uh, many cities stepped up with programs. There's an ongoing flow of information. Stamford, um, New London, as Felix has addressed, many cities have stepped up. And there was a lot of cooperation from smaller towns, particularly on the issue of health and safety. We had a few webinars where we had brought on a public health expert from the University of Connecticut. And state to town or regional health inspectors would join the webinar and talk about the challenges of working with business owners, but also the challenges the business owners had with their own customers. So we've been talking about what local, state, and federal government has done and is doing to preserve these small businesses, but what can we do as consumers, as customers, to help bolster them? Shop local. Buy, yeah. <laughs> well, exactly, buy local. Buy local, uh, and if you can't absolutely. if you can't find it for some reason, if you can't find it in Connecticut, I actually purchased something from a small business in California this morning. But I went directly to the small business. So um, buy local, and I would also say respect the rules of the shops that you are going into. Follow the science, right? If you have to wear a mask, you wear a mask. Um, you know, if they, they're asking you to use hand sanitizer when you're walking in, use the hand sanitizer. Um, I actually witnessed the other day a customer in a coffee shop um, not, not following the protocol and was asked to leave. And um, that's never fun. But if we all do our part and stick together, um, we're going to help these small businesses hopefully thrive after this pandemic. So PPP was only part of the picture for small businesses that have survived the pandemic so far. So how did our businesses manage to hang on? Well, each story is a little different. Let's start with our restaurateur, Rod Cornish. Yeah, I mean, it pivoted immediately because um, I'm from the kind of mindset that you have, to, you have to just keep going. You can't just lay down, you know, you have to keep it moving forward because the biz business is almost like a machine. You have to keep it oiled, you have to keep it moving. Otherwise, once it seizes up, you have, you have problems. So right. one of the first things we did immediately is we switched to a more takeout because that's all we were allowed to do. So um, fortunately, I just switched over to a new point of sale system, which had online ordering, which, which was, was a game changer for us because um, right in the beginning, we had takeout lined up because nobody can go anywhere you know, to sit down. So um, we, the managers who were working with me, um, they, they really embraced it and learned the system. And um, I'll never forget the first day we were taking orders. The phone was constantly busy. Everyone's mad. And um, Liz was taking the order. And in the time she took the order from the person on the phone, we had five tickets pop up from online ordering. And I was like, wow, this is, a, this is amazing. And also, we actually started doing groceries. I mean, we were selling um, because a lot of people just didn't want to go to the store. So we were selling um, paper towel, toilet paper, all, all kinds of stuff. Like we had put it right in our online ordering system. And um, people were actually ordering other grocery stuff, stuff they couldn't get, yeast. I mean, it was, it was interesting. We're, um, we hustle, so I mean, whatever, whatever we need to do, you know, we did. We had customers that came through. I mean, they were like leaving big tips for the staff. They were, um, we were actually building um, masks for people. We took all our old hot rod t-shirts and tank tops and we were, we were building, um, selling masks basically at cost and people coming in and buying a mask and donating a mask for somebody else who needed it. So it, the, the community really came together for us. Welcome to our second show. I'm Rod. Carlos. And uh, we actually have a name for our show. We got some good response from the first one. It's going to be called Winging It, Cooking with Carlos and Rod. We had the time on our hands, and um, Carlos and I had, um, Chef Carlos and I had always talked about doing a um, food show, you know, and, and all of a sudden with all the time in our hands, and um, we had a great social media group helping us, um, we decided this is the time to do the show. So we did a show, we have a YouTube channel, it's called Winging It, and we We'd show people how to cook at home, some of the things that we were doing here. And we just had a lot of fun with that. We still have, Carlos and I still get stopped from people asking us about it and, and different things, so. So the first thing I did was make sure that every product we have available in our store was also available on our website. We started sending out way more emails to encourage people to shop with us. We offered curbside pickup. Um, 
private shopping experiences for you know people that could we could do video chats and Zoom calls. We also started doing Facebook live events so we could connect with customers through social media. So while our retail store was taking a hit, um, our wholesale accounts were also taking a hit because many stores we sell to had to close. But our custom revenue stream was really helpful. We found that a lot of the yoga studios and restaurants that we make custom apparel for, their customers wanted to support them too. And they couldn't go in and practice yoga or eat food but they could buy a t-shirt to support those companies. So we ended up making a lot of merchandise for other small businesses that they could sell. So that really helped us out uh, when things were looking pretty dark. And one of the fun things that we did once the weather got warmer last spring was do sidewalk sales. And I brought a big speaker outside and blasted Yacht Rock and like kind of threw a party outside and people were just you know, passing by. We couldn't really connect, but it was a really fun way to be like, we're still here, we're all, we're all still having fun. Um, so we tried a lot of different weird things to get people, you know, to remind them that we were here and to get people engaged. So we're really just trying to have as much fun as we could in really dark times. One of the things is normally we would, I would place a large order um, for the season. But what I did was now, um, if someone came in and needed a color that I didn't have in stock, I would just order as needed. Um, I didn't place those big seasonal orders like I would normally place. And so it was a change and a shift in how things came in. So, and I have to say my customers were really good and understood that um, you, you're not gonna walk in and find every color on the shelf. Also did a lot more social media marketing than I probably normally would do. Um, a lot of Instagram, a lot of uh, Facebooking, which is extremely time consuming, taking photos, um, just putting out uh, if a uh, vendor sent new information on a new pattern, just doing a lot, a lot of social media, which is which changed for me because I wouldn't normally have to do as much. But that was a big change for me, making sure, especially Instagram. I do a, some Facebooking, but also putting out their face uh, for Instagram because I do have some younger um, customers as well. Well, did that work out for you? I mean, have you have you gotten more customers or have people appreciated that extra level of communication with you? Interestingly enough, I have seen a lot of new faces during this time, and uh, which is nice. I'm just hoping that as we open up more, that I will continue to see these to see them. People were placing orders online, as well as they would call, um, and during that time. I was doing curbside pickup, and in a couple cases, I had to do some actual home deliveries when I was on my way home for the day or before I came in in the morning. That's awesome. So you you were like a, a delivery service. You were like a Grubhub for, for yarn. <laughs> yes, I was. Like I said, when, when you're met with an adverse situation, you have to figure out how you're going to adapt and what you have to do to keep going. <laughs> you know, I don't think that I did anything all that different. I, I just went with the, the trends out there, curbside pickup, offering delivery, uh, you know, ha I set up some private appointments at one time so that if somebody wanted to come in and just be here with me and flip the stacks, I'd let them do that. We would be masked up and sanitizer, the whole shebang. Um, so I did whatever I could to get through the, the rough spots at the beginning where things just weren't happening. You know, this, this room was sort of a uh, community space for, for our our local bands and, and sort of a, a nurturing space for, to, for the scene to, to bring people together with live music that wa was other than clubs. And so I wasn't able to do that. Um, and so for a lot, of, a lot of COVID, I was trying to find a way to bridge that gap. And, um, you know, our 10th anniversary was in October and I, I really wanted to do something there to mark the occasion. But at that point, I just didn't have my head around it. But in January, we were able to pull together 20 bands and they provided uh, videos of them performing in their spaces or, or even more creative videos that looked more like old school MTV. And we put together an online program um, that was about three hours long, uh, bands from around the region, around the state, a lot, lot from here in New London. And, and we had kind of this variety show online that was, it was exciting to see uh, it, it, it helped me do this thing that I used to do for the bands and bring that into the modern post-COVID era or whatever. And uh, uh, yeah, it was, it, 
So that was a little out of the box and, and it worked very well. So panel, I'm just floored by how nimbly these businesses changed what they were doing and, and seemed to make it work. Uh, Fran Pastori, was this something you heard as well? Absolutely. We were running, you know, pivoting your business for probably the last six months, you know, doing training sessions, talk sessions, support groups, all around pivoting. So I do have one really amazing story to share that I'm, I just heard about from one of our clients. Um, we have a woman in Bridgeport who makes the most amazing, and I say delicious, soaps made with natural oil and goat's milk. And she, despite um, all of the um, support and understanding of uh, a good strategic marketing plan and the role that social media plays in helping to build a small business, she was very, very resistant to that. When the pandemic hit, her main way of, um, sa of, of securing sales was uh, to um, spa um, trade shows, right? And of course, when the pandemic hit, those trade shows died out. So finally, she said, and the name of the business is Comfort Zone. Um, and so finally, she told me the other day that her revenues increased by July 186%. Why? Because she tells me she got out of her comfort zone and finally started using social media and started talking about how if you can't go to the spa, you create a spa-like environment at home and pushing her products that way. Joe Ercolano, what did you hear from your clients? Well, we had a client who uh, provided driving lessons and um, all of that was shut down in-person driving lessons. They came to us, we had some, we were fortunate to have some UConn students over the summer who did a, a ton of research on, on, on this whole topic of learning over online, learning driving online and trying to address any objections that the state regulators might have on this. And as a result, they petitioned the state, got permission to do this across the board, not just for their own business, but for all driving companies in Connecticut driving schools. And it opens up not just an immediate you know, way to pivot, but it opens up the potential to use technology to further their business goals going forward. One of the things that uh, uh, Rod Cornish, uh, who owns Hot Rod's Cafe, mentioned, uh, I don't think it's included in uh, this particular special, but what he talked about was that the pandemic um, exposed the weaker parts of his business. So I get the sense that even when things go back to normal, and help me out here, the changes that many of these businesses went through will remain. Do you get a sense of that as well? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. There, and there's, there's just now there's just different ways of making money. I think that's how these small businesses are, are looking at this, where, you know, this was the traditional way of making money. Now, OK, let's try this. Let's try that. Let's try this. Um, and these businesses collaborating with each other are helping, you know, create ideas of reaching different markets. Um, and, you know, and that balance, I think, starts protecting people, not only from a pandemic, but, you know, maybe you're a seasonal business. And now you found a way to make money in the wintertime where that wasn't the case anymore. So we're hoping to see a little bit of that happening. And I think these small businesses, that ones that have survived and have gotten through this are savvy enough uh, to know that's that's the new reality moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, you know, uh, adapt or die, you know, uh, mm -hmm. not not to put, make it so cut and dry, but adapt or die. And I think that those are some of the silver linings, you know, diversifying your product line, diversifying your access to markets. And that's the intention of this uh, small grant program that WVDC launched a couple of months ago. It's not for general operating. It's not to pay your rent. It's to Think out of the box, think a little more creatively, because we want you to survive, not only survive, but thrive post-pandemic. Hey, Joe, I want to ask you about uh, small businesses that have actually decided to make a go of it during the pandemic. Is this a good time to do that? Yes. We've had more people contact us about starting a business than any time over the last seven years. Um, and not all of them start, but they've contacted and they're interested in doing it. And it is a good time because there will be a, a, a pent up demand in consumer spending that'll hit the streets, so to speak, over the next six to 12 months. It's inevitable. So it's a great time. I mean, are interest rates lower? Is that a, a good reason? 
if interest rates are lower and you know you could um, you know tap, tap some of these uh, special programs that are out there you know maybe it's an emergency loan that you can't start a business with an emergency loan but if you start and you get going and you have some some traction under your belt one of these loans might be helpful but interest rates are lower across the board um, people are you know leaving real estate and people are finding deals in real estate and um, they, I just think people know, you know, there will be a surge of, of spending coming. So they're going to take advantage of that. Yeah. Well, you know, most entrepreneurs start businesses because they have a passion and there's a need or an opportunity in the marketplace, right? So absolutely, lots of opportunities right now. But for many, many, many people, and I'll keep going back to this because it's my, you know, it's, it's something I have a soft spot for. For many, many people, um, the opportunity has nothing to do with it. It's about the necessity. And the majority of those people are women and the majority of those people are black and brown women. Um, we've seen a 20% increase over the number of new startups among um, ethnic minorities in, in Connecticut, uh, and women. And that is a trend around the country and we've seen it at the state level. So a lot of women um, and again, a lot of black and brown women were pushed out of jobs in the industries that were most vulnerable, healthcare, education, retail, hospitality. Um, and they were left with few options. And so coming up with a service-based business um, is, is the way they need to survive. And so, like I said, you know, necessity is sometimes the mother of invention. And I think we're seeing a lot of that as well. So I had a chance to visit one more business. It opened during the pandemic back in November, and it seemed like a particularly fitting business to profile given the frustrating year that we've all endured. Maybe that's why it's been so successful. Let's check out Smash Avenue in West Hartford. My name is Sean Chambers, and this is my pandemic business, Smash Avenue. <laughs> First, tell me about, tell me about yourself. Um, so I'm born and raised here in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, decided during um, the COVID pandemic that people needed a way to de-stress. I mean, we were dealing with a lot. Parents were becoming teachers and kids being stuck at, you know, at home with parents for long periods of time now, which we've never really had to deal with. Um, not being able to go out and have fun at your usual uh, activities. Um, just not being able to go out at all. And there was just so much pent up frustration. We felt like there had to be a way to unleash that negative energy in a positive way, in a healthy way, in a judgment free way. And um, that's how Smash Avenue was born. Was it, a, was it a long conversation that you had with your business partner? I mean, were you like... No, it wasn't a very long conversation at all. Well, you knew it, you had the space. Well, we, we found the space later. Actually, um, I created uh, a makeshift smash room in my garage first as a proof of concept. So everything you see here, you know, the plywood, the bricks, we, all, we put it all up in the garage. Uh, had a good friend of mine come in and spray paint everything to give it the feeling. And um, we just reached out to uh, a random pool of people to have them come by and ask a few questions. Hey, how has this pandemic affected you? How has it affected your family, your job? And um, the responses that we got were mind blowing. And, you know, there was some tears shed and, you know, people were, were really distraught, um, which we, we knew was the case, right? Um, so afterward, we said, hey, we got this, you know, this new business model that we're working on. We want you to come in and be able to smash some things to kind of unburden yourself. Is that something that you'd be interested in? And they all were interested. Uh, we videotaped them smashing all of the items that we put into the space. And then we uh, did a post interview to ask them how they felt. And everybody was like, wow, it's like I, I couldn't believe how much better I feel. Or, you know, now I feel like I can go home and be around my kids again, like <laughs> stuff like that. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's shocking because these are things that we deal with on a day to day basis. It's just part of life. But you don't understand how much it weighs on people until it's, you know, compiled with other things that we really can't control, like COVID. Yeah, smash therapy. Smash therapy. I like it. And it always sounds good, right? Everybody wants to be your first customer until the business is open. Right. And then you see how many people actually patronize the business, mm -hmm. um, but people actually followed through. Um, and, you know, we've been moving about two to three tons of smashed waste out of here on a weekly basis. So 
I'd like to say that things are going pretty good. <laughs> when did you open? Uh, we opened November 5th, uh, 2020. Yeah. So right in the thick of things. Yeah. So uh, we did the panel discussion and I think I asked the, I was telling you about this. I think I was asking the small business uh, expert mm -hmm. to open, I, th I said to open a, a small business in this climate, in this pandemic, yeah. in a recession, you have to be either savvy or crazy. So which one are you? Probably, probably both. <laughs> probably both. Was it a, was it a good time to do it? it? It feels good to me. Like I said, there hasn't been smiles in a long time and I'm here smiling. So um, the, the Smash Room is the first one in Connecticut. Always feels good being the first to market, doing anything. Um, it's a very unique offering. Um, people are really excited about it. We're getting a lot of great reviews and feedback and we're looking to scale the business um, fairly soon. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, uh, just a little bit of nuts and bolts about how you, you have to, you, you obviously have to purchase this stuff. Yes. You just don't find it. You... Ish. Donations are always welcome. Mm -hmm. So um, we try to put ourselves out there to as many of those, um, you know, communities on Facebook or, you know, Goodwills and things like that. Um, whenever they can't sell something because it's damaged or it's irregular and they don't want to put it out into the market, then, you know, they normally get rid of it. So we just kind of become a way for them to save a step. And then we repurpose. So, um, you know, we smash it here and then we recycle everything anyway. So uh, for a lot of people who would normally recycle, it's just another stop before it makes its final destination. So, you know, I'm extremely happy with, you know, our community here in the, the greater Hartford area and even outside of the greater Hartford area, people traveling, you know, 90 minutes to come and have a 20 to 30 minute experience here with us in our little space, you know? Um, if that doesn't tell you you made the right decision, then I don't know what does. As we wrap up this edition of Cutline, I asked each of the small business owners profiled in this show what their plans were for the rest of 2021. I sincerely hope that you learned something about the importance of these businesses to the state's economy and to the quality of life for the communities they serve. This is Cutline. For Connecticut Public, I'm Ray Hardman. Thanks for watching. Being a small business owner and, and making my living on my drawings is sort of like a dream come true. And I know that we are capable of so much more here. Um, I have a really, really great team. We all work really hard and very efficiently together and we are ready for growth. So I'm very confident that we will keep growing for sure. So, yeah, so I, I can imagine once once we're people are more fully vaccinated, um, I think there's a lot of pent up demand. I mean, we'll never make up for what we lost because it's not like people are going to come here and eat a thousand wings. They're just going to start eating wings again every week. So. I think next year is going to be our best year ever because every year for the most part over the last 15 there's been a steady growth it just took something like this to to kind of put the brakes on i i feel very confident just the the, the plans that our city is making on, and i'm part of some of those plans to help re, restart new london once uh things get going again i i i think there's going to be a lot of business and um and we'll all be able to sort of lift up again uh, here in New London and hopefully throughout the state. I hope to be here 20, 30 years down the road and just sitting behind the counter talking music with people. That, that's been my goal all along. So uh, if, if I can maintain that, um, this, this is my retirement plan. So <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna stick with it. <laughs>
my hopes um, that I'll be here for a long time, that I'll be able to sustain, that I can still continue to be that community, that community space. Um, one thing that yarn shops, I always equate us to like barber shops and hair salons. My space is, is community. When you come in, uh, hopefully you feel warm, welcome, um, comfortable. I sometimes thought I wanted to grow and be much larger, but as I really thought about it and I said, you know, I like where I'm at, I like my space because I want to have that personal connection with my customers. This is about building relationships. It's not just a business, it's about building those relationships and knowing what's going on in a person's life. And I um, think a lot of things have been shared in these walls and a lot of some tears have been shed and some laughter. And that's, that's all I hope for is that this continues to be that sense of community and people feel warm and welcome when they walk in the door. This program is made possible with support from the Connecticut Small Business Development Center.